it. That's it. it. You gotta have the adversity. excited right now. Uh, it's Wednesday. Uh, our opening day here in Montana is on Saturday. And I'm getting pretty jacked. We're headed deep into the breaks. Um, we're going to meet up with Travis here. And pack in tomorrow. It's going to be a great week. Um, I'm super excited to see what it entails and just super stoked to be back in elk country. I don't think it gets any better. You know, the first week in September, that's all your mind can think and to actually be here is just all that like time going into it and thinking about is now you know we're here we're doing it Wednesday man we're gonna kill one next week massive bull 400 bull 475 bull 500 bull <laughs> that's what we're after out here is 500 bull
order for us to get our backcountry camp set up, we had to pack in over 14 gallons of water because the water out there is super scarce. Then we had to pack in our hunting, camping, and camera gear. And that was gonna take us about a day and a half of preparation in order to get our, our spike camp set up. The reason we wanted to set up this backcountry camp is Josh and Brand hunted this area in years past and they'd had a lot of success in seeing a bunch of elk not to mention the hunter pressure was going to be hopefully fairly minimal since we were backpacking in so far. Um, so that was the plan and we were hoping the, the elk were going to be bugling and we were going to have good success early. What's your plan? I don't know with this wind. I'll either go with you guys and hop Scotch Ridges, or I was thinking about hitting the right side of, you know, up here, going yeah. to the right. Yeah. Hitting and trying to look into like that first, there's a couple of drainages there. Yeah. And then working kind of maybe towards where that five by five kind of came out of general area. That'd be pretty solid. And then that way we can kind of be potentially across the basin from each other. I mean, I'll be a ways away, yeah. but maybe around the end. That'd be legit. Hopefully it pays off. You're going to find a whopper. 500 bull. <laughs> <laughs> spotted already they're all kind of on the smaller side but it's giving me hope that we're gonna run into a big boy in here um, this is the first coolie so we got a, a couple more to go and I think we're gonna find what we're looking for out here today first spot that bull I mean that's the biggest bull we've seen so far and it's a tough decision to make but uh, I knew he was for sure a shooter and Jay and I were watching that bull most of the morning heard him bugling chasing some cows hanging out with some other bulls and finally he bedded down and Jay and I were both like fist pumping because he actually bedded where we could see him and pinpoint his location um, which doesn't happen too often He's actually in a, a stockable spot. We just want to wait, wait to make sure that the, the thermals kind of level out and then we'll put together a game plan and hopefully put a stock on this guy soon. All right, we've crept in. It's been about two hours since we left that bowl in his bed. We're gonna sneak right up here in the bowl take our boots off, sneak super slow up this ridge and hope he's still there. If so, the wind's, it's been good for the last 30 minutes. So if he's still there, I think you have a pretty good chance of killing this elk. Let's go. So as we crept to the cliff edge, I was able to get a pretty good view of the bull. Um, I couldn't see his vitals and instantly I was thinking, you know, I'm going to have to wait and let him stand on his own. I didn't want to throw a rock or try to cow call and have him look, put all of his attention on me. 
want him to be completely oblivious to me being there. And I was just hoping that I was going to get an opportunity. And sure enough, you know, 45 minutes into it, the bull stood up and things just came together and happened really quick. Told you the spot would produce, dude. Sick, dude. <laughs> That's so, so sick. Yeah. First morning in. That's dope. Uh, yeah. Is it right over the edge or what? I'll show you, dude. I literally like we snuck in to like. Oh, dude, that's so epic. Like, right here, and he was, like, see these gap in the yeah. stage? He was literally, like, on this side oh, of that dude, bush what? right there. But I felt good about it. Shot him, hit him. I could see the arrow hanging out of him. He came right over here. Did you not get a full pass through, or what? No, which sucked. Did you get it on the second one? I don't know, because then, then I was here, you know? Yeah. And that bull, he stopped right there, but in I, that, like... In that gap? over to the right, like behind this brush. And I'm trying to knock an arrow and I knock it outside my D loop. <laughs> and then I finally get it and I like, had to like squat and draw and he turned perfectly away and was like gonna be going, you know, he stopped right there. I just want to put another one in him. I don't know where that one hit, definitely hit him. I think it hit kind of in the same spot, so. Well, you should go find him, dude. Yeah. It's been like an hour. You shot him 130? Yeah. You should be good. This is right where he was bedded. Looks like he kept going. Shot that bull about an hour and a half ago. And <clears throat> pretty sure I got two arrows in him. Never saw him come out of the base and figured he was dead. Went down to go look for him and he popped up and went over the ridge. So I don't, I don't know what happened or why he's still alive, but uh, it's not good. We didn't see hardly any blood down there either, so. It sucks. It's now been about three hours since I shot that bull, so we're gonna try to follow the blood a little bit here, see if we can find him. We've been following blood now for probably about four or 500 yards. We don't want to push him again, so we're going to leave him overnight and see if we can find him in the morning. So we're packing up and heading back to camp. Four best friends set out this morning <laughs> with about the worst morale I think I've ever seen in a group. And <clears throat> we did a hellish grid search of this whole area. And so we looped back up and found his blood trail again. And it was one of the worst blood trails I've ever followed. Just very minimal amount of blood. And I decided I was gonna walk over here and walked up right there, saw tan and red. And I was like, no way. Like. 
I threw up my binos and I saw the antlers and I was like, <laughs> like so jacked, man. This makes the trip. Dude, the feelings I had when you said that, I was like, you're probably the biggest dick in the world if you're joking oh my right God. now. <laughs> no way, dude. Let's go see this bull, dude. Oh, dude, bomber. Bomber breaks bull, dude. Found it. Yeah. Oh, man, dude. Truly a privilege to be able to come out here and explore and hunt these amazing public lands. To hike through this wide open country called the Breaks with some of your best friends all the while chasing bull elk is an awesome experience. And it's definitely one that I will never take for granted. The Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge goes by, you know, the abbreviation CMR. And it is probably one of the most cherished resources that we have here in Montana and probably in the West. It's 1.1 million acres and is the second largest national wildlife refuge in the lower 48. And it sits in some pretty remarkable country. It's right along the Missouri River, and basically the prairies break down into the river bottom over the course of 10 to 20 miles. It's vast, vast country, and it's a really wild place. People think of wilderness as being in the mountains, but this place is extremely wild. You can come out here and, and get stuck or get bit by a rattlesnake and not make it out. I mean. It, it can get gnarly out here. The weather can change quick and, you know, I think that's part of the allure of it. Um, a lot of people come out here and it's a really beautiful landscape. It's got lots of wildlife and lots of recreation opportunities. And I think that it's definitely ingrained itself in a lot of people's lives and made a lot of lasting impacts on people. And I think that there was a lot of good foresight in setting this apart as public land and I'm glad that places like this exist and I'm sure I'll be coming back to the CMR for a long time and uh, it's just a place that once you've been out here it, it kind of gets in your blood and it's somewhere that you always come back to even if even if you haven't been out here for a while it's, it's something that you're always looking forward to coming back to.
so it's the first night in here. We just hiked in, probably three miles back. We're gonna go uh, see if we can find us a bowl. Uh, these guys say it's been a little slow, not seeing a whole lot, not hearing a whole lot, but we're gonna go have a look, see what we can come up with, and kill that big one. September 13th, it's my first night hiked in here to a spot I found last year. We spooked a cow on the way in, found a few more bedded, found one nice uh, six by seven bull. It's not huge, probably a 300 class, but it's good to see the first day. It's, uh, it's encouraging seeing elk first night in here. Hope we find them tomorrow. We're going to come back to this same spot in the morning and try and relocate this bull. Heard a couple other bugles. So we'll see what we can find in the morning. See if we can get it done tomorrow. So we're kind of holding back. Uh, we might try and get up above him. Um, see what the wind's doing the further up we, we get up on the hill.
Oh, buddy. Dude, I had to stop before I, I had Thank you. Did I hit him good? You hit him so good, I think, dude. Oh. Buddy. <laughs> All right, we got a really good bull running out of daylight. We got to get him cut up and get as much of him out of here as we can tonight. We got some work cut out for us. He's uh, pretty far from the truck. But man, I cannot be happier. <laughs> he is a beaut. Killing elk ain't easy. And packing them out certainly ain't easy. <laughs> I'm defeated. Feeling pretty tired. Knees hurting from the hike in. We're gonna try and get two fronts and the back straps and inside loins out tonight. Might be a bit of a stretch, but we're gonna go for it. We got the uh, Travis and Jay are coming in in the morning. I think they're en route now, so we'll have some help tomorrow. Thank goodness. Well, Zach just sent us a photo of the bull jaw shot. This is what we're going to be packing out, helping them pack out. We got probably two, two and a half hours of driving left till we get in there, then another hour and 15 minute hike. And then some heavy packs. Right now we're trying to get in front of a rainstorm that's coming through. So trying to make it in there before the gumbo starts so that we can actually help them pack it out. So we're just gonna fill up gas and keep on driving into the night. We just arrived. It's 3.28 in the morning. We gotta meet those guys at 5.30, so. We're gonna get our packs ready, make sure we're all set to go, and maybe hang out for a little bit before we do our hour and a half hike in to meet them. And then from there, we probably have another three miles at least to try to get to that, get to that bowl so we can pack them out, so. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a long day. Jay and I didn't get any sleep, pulled all nighter. So I think they'll appreciate the help with the pack out though. That's what elk season's all about. You gotta help out your buddies. Put some extra weight on your back and do what you do to help them out. So what's up dude? Hey, oh bro. bro. Congrats, homies. Thanks, buddy. That is a beautiful bull. You see him? Yeah, nice. so sick, dude. I know, man. I couldn't be happier. Heck oh. yeah. He's a ways back Woo! there, though. <laughs> mm. That's how I feel, Jay. It wouldn't have been that bad, but we were so dehydrated and, like, did not... Dude, it was hot yesterday. Yeah. I did not, like, looking at the forecast, I thought yesterday was when it was going to start getting cold. Mm -hmm. I only brought, like, 64 ounces of my freaking water. Dude, 
I was already like knew I really had to start rationing water when we killed that bull. I was pretty happy, man. That thing couldn't have really hit much better. Maybe we, we both knew it dead as soon as he shot it. Dude, his thirds are sick. He's got decent mass. It's not like super, super thick. Like, scoot it over, dude. Find like the antlers, boom, pop up. And... and the marathon begins. Not easy. But if you want it, this is what you gotta do. They don't all live by the car. <laughs> So growing up here in Montana, public lands have really helped shape who I am as an individual. It's really all the things I love that encompass who I am really take place on these public lands. Um, I consider myself an avid fly fisherman. Um, I snowboard very passionately in the winter time and hunt in the fall and all these activities that really compose who I am as an individual, I do on these public lands. Some of the best skiing I've ever experienced has been out on public land hiking into the backcountry. Um, here in Montana, our, under our public stream access law, we can fish any of the rivers and streams um, free of charge. You find a bridge, you can jump off of it, and if you stay within that legal high water mark, you're free to roam and to be out there and experience what is your public water um, and your public land. And to me, that's important, you know, coming from a family of decent means, but not, a, you know, a rich, high, wealthy family. I, I couldn't afford to go out and pay to fish or to hunt or to ski. Um, and to do it, especially as, as passionately as I am, I'm, I'm fishing upwards of 200 days a year. We come out on these hunts and we're hunting a week to two weeks to up to four weeks. You know, I had a mountain goat tag that was all do it yourself on public land and I could I was out there for four weeks on end chasing goats um, no one was there to tell me where I could or couldn't go um, you, you really get a taste of, of that heritage of the West you know to be able to come out and wander or to go walk a river bank you know or to go oh, I want to hike up on that mountain and to be able to do that and experience that is important. I think it's important for our future generations to be able to, to have that too, to not just hear stories of how good the fishing used to be or these hills used to run abundant with elk, but for them to still be able to come 50 to 100 to 300 years from now and to be able to experience, you know, some of these experiences they've heard from the stories, whether it's the old tales of Jim Bridger running the mountains or from the, the Great Plains Indians hunting and surviving on their own, or whatever it may be, you still have this opportunity to get out here and to experience these things. And a lot of it wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this without these, you know, the conservation of this public land. And to have that, it's important. Last night, 
Josh left with his load of meat. Got a nice bowl earlier in the week and this morning's my first morning to hunt. It's cold, it's like 36 degrees and foggy, so we're gonna get headed down this ridge. Hopefully they're fired up and bugling. We'll see, but the conditions are looking good for the next week. This year I wanted to hunt with a recurve. Last year I had wanted to as well, but I didn't have the time to get skilled with the bow. And this year I basically shot enough to where I could hunt out to 25 yards. And it's something that I've always thought was, you know, the ultimate form of hunting to go out there with a stick and string and, and do something that's so instinctive and simple. Um, there's something pretty primal about that, something in your DNA as a hunter that really connects with you on a deep level and it, it forces you to have an experience to be successful and I, I think a lot of people kind of lose fact of you know we're actually hunting for the experience out here notching the tag is the end goal but what we really remember is the experience and getting close to the animals and seeing and hearing all the crazy things out here and you know the recurve pretty much forces you to embrace that. Definitely didn't want to get out of bed this morning. Glad we did. Got all our gear figured out and all the crap back in the truck and found two bulls over here bugling at each other. Snuck in closer, had a brief encounter with a raghorn that thought we were two lonely cows or something. and. We've been watching these bulls all morning. They haven't really been moving much and we haven't had really any good opportunities to sneak in on them. Both of them are bedded right now. So we're gonna try to figure out a game plan and hopefully get in on one of them today. Let's just say, if I kill one here, I can see the truck. I think we're gonna try to go give it a shot and stalk in there and see what happens. He's in a pretty good spot. And there's too many what ifs if we sit here all day. So, wind's good, train's good. Not sure where the raghorn is, but just gotta go in there and hope for the best.
That's a frustrating end to a really good stock. Oh man, bow hunting is not easy and hunt with a recurve and it's even harder. We got into 17 yards of that bull in his bed. I don't know how long we were here, maybe three minutes, five, I don't know, we were here for a little bit. The bull started kind of looking around, kind of seemed a little uneasy. I knew he was gonna get up and uh, I just kind of tucked over because I could see his rack and I was pretty much hoping that he would stand and maybe look back up the hill and I could ease up all the way, draw and hit him, but he stood and looked right at me. And I don't know, maybe I could have stood up and drawn and shot him. Maybe he would have just looked at me, but I don't know. I just felt in my gut that he was gonna bust and I was hoping that he'd turn and look and I'd get a shot on my terms. I've rushed him in the past and it's never worked out, so. Just didn't get the shot I wanted. Bull busted, but we got a couple other bulls bugling that we heard here just now, so day's not over yet. My name's Randy Matchett. I'm the Fish and Wildlife Service in the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge. And been a biologist here for going on 30 years now. It's a, it's a pretty neat place. You know, you talk to some of the old timers and, you know, they might think that we don't have the quality bulls that we used to have, but, you know, surveys that I fly in December, I still see a lot of, you know, nice bulls post hunting season and there's lots of hunters that harvest nice bulls. You talked about seeing a lot. It's nice that this area is, is managed for more abundant bulls and, and older age class bulls than a lot of other places in the state. And it's fortunate that there's a management flexibility here to do that. And, and a lot of that's driven by the huge expanses of public land that are here. The refuge being, you know, a big component of that. From the old days, just to kind of put things in perspective, and, and just for the record, the, the elk that are here now originated from Yellowstone National Park in 1950 and 51. It was a combination of fish, wildlife, and parks, and what was then the Fort Peck Game Range, and some local ranchers in, in reintroducing elk here in 1950 and 51. I think a total of 161 were released. So based on those surveys back in 1964, they estimated that the number of elk was not less than 64 or more than 76 in the area between Highway 191 and the Muscle Shell River on the south side of the river. Jump ahead 20 some years to 1985 and there was quite a bit of conflict and controversy regarding bow hunting back in 1985 and and it's interesting in that this proposal was developed in response to complaints by archers about the quality of the elk hunting experience. And the primary problems mentioned were too many hunters 30 years ago. We dropped down a little bit and based on predictions from the data that they had at the time, in 1986, there was almost 500 archers hunting three to 400 elk in about 300 square miles. And so that's kind of where we were way back then. What I just read came from this part of the graph back in 1985, and this is the number of elk that have actually been harvested in all of the Missouri River breaks combined. And so those issues were happening back here when a total of two to 300 elk were being harvested between rifle and archery combined. Here more lately, 2004 to 2012, uh, an average of 1,800 elk were harvested annually. And so over the last 30 years, you can kind of see how this population has grown and grown and grown. And, and you know, we still have complaints about too many hunters and competition and things like that. And a few years ago, it was a really high conflict situation, but 
it's always been like that and that's part of it and that's that's where you know the refuge system and montana fish wildlife and parks were both you know public wildlife management agencies and serve the public and we try and take a lot of these things into account but i often find it useful to kind of look back sometimes and see where we were <laughs> relative to where we are today and and even though there might be you know unsatisfied people there's a lot of satisfied ones as well and and i think we're in a pretty good place you know today with the number of elk that we have working with landowners and landowner tolerance which is a big thing to consider but compared to where we were 30 years ago we've you know a couple orders of magnitude more elk here and more people and you know i think that's a good thing One of the great things and, and also one of the frustrating things hunting out here is you get to see a lot of elk and seeing a big bull doesn't mean you're going to get close to them and it doesn't mean you're going to stalk them and if you can't handle that you're going to get frustrated really quick but you know the landscape out here is pretty open and you get to lay eyes on on quite a few elk i know this year so far we've gotten to see quite a few good bulls and we haven't got stocks on probably 75% of them. And that's just kind of how it goes out here. They tend to bed really quick in the day and, and they bed pretty smart. It's tough to stalk them at that point. So um, definitely a big difference between seeing elk and stalking elk. Dude, that bull is like huge. That second on his left is like 24 inches. Yeah, he's a freaking beast. We finally put eyes on that bull that we've been hearing this morning. And he crossed the coulee. He's definitely a dandy bull. He's he's big. He's probably the one of, if not the biggest bull that we've seen so far this year. And 
There's three other little spikes over there which I'm with him, which is pretty weird, but we just bedded him down, so we're gonna watch him for a little bit. Try to come up with a game plan, hopefully. It, it looks like you could go stalk him and shoot him with a compound, but I don't know if I, I can get close enough right now with my recurve or not. I have to look at it a little bit longer. While we were watching that blowing his bed and shifts, <clears throat> one guy sleeping, one guy glassing. And Travis ended up losing that bowl and we watched the spikes feed off to a different area. We never saw a big bowl, so kind of have no idea where he's at. He could still be up there, but we're not able to see him, so. Pretty much gonna sit here until the night and see what happens. This day was just a great example of seeing an awesome bull, but never getting to really feel like you were hunting him. When you get into the second half of the archery season, the elk are super smart and those big bulls, they just don't make mistakes very often. That night, we snuck across the coulee and slowly worked up close to where we'd last seen him, but unfortunately, we never saw that bull again. The coolest part of the encounter though, was going back to the truck that night and looking at the footage a bit closer and realizing that this bull was the same one we'd seen just a mile away at the end of last season. The crazy G2 he had was sort of a dead giveaway that this was in fact the same bull and it appeared that this year he lost a little bit of size in the top of his rack. It's pretty cool to see a bull that caliber surviving in an area where it's hard to go more than two miles and not hit a well-used road. To me, it was a testament to the fact that sometimes those big bulls live in small areas that get overlooked by the majority of hunters. To be able to be out in the woods with a bow in hand and have an 800 to 1,000 pound animal bugling and breaking trees and raging through the forest fighting, I mean, I don't know how it gets any better than that. For me, I've hunted elk since I started hunting. And before I started hunting them, I thought about hunting them. It's something that I've always wanted to do. And I feel like, you know, going out on like a crisp September morning and hearing a bull just like raging, and when you're coming into your calls and he's screaming at you in your face at like 40 yards, I don't think anything gets a grown man's adrenaline pumping as much as, you know, an 800 or 1,000 pound animal coming in at you screaming. I mean. It'll raise the hair on your neck, it'll raise your heart rate, it'll make grown men like completely break down and you know, get bull fever. It's it's pretty sick and be able to harvest such a majestic animal is so cool and you have so much awesome meat for the rest of the year, you know, it all makes it worth it when you're able to connect and actually harvest an animal and take it home to your family and be able to enjoy that and bring you life for the next year, you know. Well, in 
October hunt, I feel like is especially difficult. The rut should technically be winding down. Right now we're pretty confused as to what's actually going on. Um, we're still trying to find two really mature bulls and we're not just out here to smash the first raghorn that walks by us. You know, we're trying to find a real good representation of the species, which can be difficult. You know, you're not always gonna be guaranteed to see an elk out here and you never know what these elk are gonna do. These elk are not patternable. Like, you know, there are areas that I've hunted where you know, well, they're gonna come out here, they feed into this or they go here for water. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason for what these elk have to do every day. So it's a tall order for us to try to find two bulls and the hunting's been tough. We're lucky this week, the hunting pressure has sort of tapered off. So I think we're sitting in a good, a good place right now, ready to, in striking distances, some good potential. So you're gonna go down and sit in the bottom there? Yeah, I think we're gonna go down to that middle ridge and like get down there and just get our wind right and see if we can find like a natural like pathway yeah. that they take or see if we can spot some game trails. Well, yeah, that bull is for sure in the furthest draw. Yeah. yeah. Before you hit that main. Ridge. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think if we're, cause all of those canyons kind of converge they back all hit there. One, yeah. I feel like if we can be somewhat near that pinch point, I think it would be pretty ideal. Where they all hit, dude, there's a pretty strong trail in the bottom. Is there? Yeah. I'm gonna smash some smasher bulls tonight. Smash and smashers? Smash and smashers. <laughs> Alright, we just split off from Zach. We're gonna try to go to a good travel spot or pinch point where we think these bulls are gonna come out tonight. We saw a lot of elk activity in here this morning, so hopes are high that we can get ourselves into a good position and hopefully stick a bull tonight. That'd be pretty sick. After our morning reconnaissance mission, we know there's an ample amount of bulls up in the head end of this draw, so we decided to find a good ambush point. Hopefully, we get something to walk by us on these trails. We got everything in this little pinch point is within shooting distance, so hopes are high that some walks in front of us here this evening. We 
from what we'd seen on these elk for the, from the past couple days is that when it's really hot out, they don't really get very active until, you know, half hour before last light. So right about that time last night, Travis recommended we start cow calling. And I think I did like four or five cow calling sequences every about five minutes. And the last time I did it, about two minutes later, he came, here came a bull just trotting down through the timber and right down into the flat, right into our laps. Maybe. Yeah. Give him some time now. What? Is that you, B-Dog? Yeah, dude. <coughs> Hammer? Yeah. Not super stoked, but... I just did not make a good shot. <coughs> Where'd you hit him? a little bit far back, but he only went like maybe a hundred yards. Maybe like yeah, we thought we saw him flop over. He dropped pretty good and it looked like he like stood and flipped back over. He didn't get back up, so we're hoping that was the death flop, but it was at like last light. You and can barely pick him up in the binos. Huh. But he only went like 30, well, 100 yards after the shot. And then another 20 maybe. The footage is so sick. No, you keep hit it. into his. You can see it right. Keep going. Right there. Right there. Right there. See that little red dot? 
on the bottom. Yeah, see yeah. yeah. Like, you hit them right. Like, that literally looks like there. There's a little red. Isn't that it? Uh, like, go back one. Go back one. You can it. see fudging Boom. right there. I know, but which way is it angled? In. Because that's where you see the orange. Hmm. It's pretty tough to say off that, dude. Yeah. It's not It's not, not good, good no. that it didn't go in very far. But it's more than half the arrows in there. So last night definitely it was a tough one, you know, having an animal injured out here and not knowing whether they were totally expired yet or not. Um, I feel like every hunter's been there at least once. But, you know, doesn't make it any easier. And came in here this morning and, you know, definitely a little nervous. You always have that unsettled feeling. You don't really know whether it's down or whether you're gonna find it again. And uh, came in here and, he wasn't in his bed that we left him in last night, but we moved about, I don't know, 150 yards down the ridge line and glassed him up not 75 yards from where he had been bedded. Um, he looked like he was in pretty rough shape. We found the bull from last night about 75 yards from where we left him. Um, he looks like pretty rough shape. Definitely pretty tough to watch right now. Just. I mean, this is the last thing you'd want to see on a bull of this caliber, really. Or any bull, any animal for that matter. But I feel pretty good that he's going to die today. He doesn't look like he's got a whole lot of life left in him. So that was just kind of a waiting game. We watched this, we've been watching this bull since daybreak and pretty sure we just watched him expire. Um, we're gonna try to go over there and get above him and just make sure he's he's gone and go put our hands on him. back anything out. They didn't even get footage, bro. You didn't even get any footy?
<laughs> Score, dude. We just found a stash, bro. Three water bottles. Oh, my dude, there is. Dude, this is a place a guy can survive at. I can get all the little snack turds out of there. Three best friends. <laughs> We're the three best friends that anybody could have. I really like that we got a thorn bush actually right in the door. That's exceptional. No oh, elk, just a butt full of cactus tonight. Yeah, you guys see anything? Yeah, nope. No. no. Yeah. 